Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about dietary therapy and IBD. And as mentioned, this is such an important aspect of uh, care because it's one of the questions that comes up uh, over and over again for patients as well as providers. So why should we focus on diet and IBD? Well, there are many extremely important reasons for us to do this. One is, uh, although we know there is a genetic component to inflammatory bowel disease, it's really an environmental disease. And the reason we know it's an environmental disease is because over the last 100, 150 years, the incidence, uh, the number of cases continues to rise telling it's us that there's something in our environment, uh, including our dietary environment, that has changed to, to cause this increase. And if you look over on the um, right-hand side, you'll also see that uh, another important reason to look at uh, diet and IBD is that our medications are really good, but they're not 100%, meaning that all the medications don't always reach 100% of our patients in terms of getting them into clinical remission, uh, as well as um, uh, getting their symptoms uh, under control. And then finally, IBD is an expensive disorder or disease. Uh, it causes uh, not only a financial burden for the individual, but also for the whole medical system. Uh, and this is interrelated to many reasons. Uh, one, uh, the cost of medications, which can cause uh, cost uh, up to tens of thousands of dollars each year, but also in terms of the personal impact, the time off from work, the time that one needs to go to uh, the physician or have a procedure. And so looking at ways that we can decrease the cost for the individual as well as uh, the system as a whole is important, and diet uh, is one of those areas uh, that uh, can do that. But to understand uh, diet's effect in IBD, uh, it's important to understand IBD itself. And we know that IBD is an immune dysregulation. So our immune system, uh, which helps fight off infection, has gotten confused and is now starting to attack the bowels. Um, and there are multiple reasons for this, uh, and there are multiple important aspects of this. Uh, one is the microbiome, or the 100 trillion bacteria within our GI tract. So if you think about 100 trillion, that's 15,000 times the number of people in the world in our gut as bacteria. So that's a big number, and this is what we think instigates IBD. Another important uh, reason is mucosal integrity, so the lining of the GI tract. So our <coughs> in IBD, the lining gets broken down, um, and so that allows the microbiome, those bacteria, to get closer to the immune system and instigate uh, an immune reaction. Now, why diet is important in all of this is because diet affects all three of these areas as well. So diet can change the bacteria in the GI tract to being good or being dysbiotic, being pro-inflammatory. Diet can actually also have an effect on the mucosal integrity, so the lining of the GI tract itself. And then finally, diet can also have a direct uh, effect on inflammation. So all those things that are important in IBD are also affected by diet. So let's take each one of these areas one by one. So how does diet, the foods we eat, affect the bacteria in our GI tract? Well, a really easy way to think of this, instead of thinking of bacteria, you can think about multicellular organisms. So think about a tiger, a dolphin, a panda, a gorilla, a cow. And if we were all to feed all of these animals the same food, let's take it hay, um, we would see that many of these animals wouldn't survive. We wouldn't have that many dolphins uh, if we were just to feed them hay. And we'd have a plethora of cows. 
Um, you can change that to bacteria. And instead of uh, hay, think about the foods that we eat. And this is going to shift the type of bacteria because different bacteria like to eat different foods. And we know this from a lot of really well done studies. And this is just one of the studies that I like uh, the most. And this is a study uh, by Rothschild. Uh, and what they looked at uh, was different populations of people within Israel. And there were uh, Ashkenazi Jews or Jews from Europe. There were Jews from Africa and Spain. Uh, there were uh, um, Middle Eastern individuals not of Jewish descent. Uh, there were individuals of African descent. And they looked at their genetics. And then they looked at their environment. And what they saw was that the environment, including the dietary environment, dominated over genetics in shaping the gut microbiota. So what they ate really affected what was living within them. But as I had mentioned, it's not only the microbiota which is important in IBD, but it's also the lining of the GI tract, the part of the GI tract that gets irritated and ulcerated, that gets broken down in IBD. And we know that there are a lot of different foods that can have a negative effect on the lining of the GI tract. So there are emulsifiers, which have been shown to break down the GI tract, high-fat, high-sugar diets, carrageenan, caking agents, all which can have a negative impact on the lining of the GI tract. Now, that doesn't mean you have to avoid all of these as an absolute. But just knowing that they can have an effect on the GI tract and the amount one eats can have um, a negative effect. And that's just important to keep in the back of your mind. And finally, we talked about the direct effect uh, of foods on the immune function. And there are many foods that are uh, pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory. And as you could guess, the anti-inflammatory foods look kind of like this. They're the whole foods that we eat, the fruits, the vegetables, the foods that have different colors, purple, orange, green, which can have a positive anti-inflammatory effect on the GI tract. So at this point, you're probably saying, well, that's all fine and dandy. I really like the basic science, but really, I'm here to learn what I can do uh, to help improve uh, my IBD. And there are dietary regimes that have been shown not only to have a positive effect on symptoms, but also decrease the inflammation. And the best studied uh, and also a part of the mainstay of nutritional therapy is something called exclusive enteral nutrition. And this is for Crohn's disease specifically. This therapy... Uh, is when you take formula and formula alone uh, and nothing else to drink or eat, uh, and you do that for a period of time. Sometimes it's six weeks, sometimes it's eight weeks, sometimes it's 10 weeks. But we know that this works extremely well in terms of causing healing uh, in the GI tract. Oh, and you can actually take this uh, via um, drinking or via nasal gastric tube. And that's a picture of uh, some of us in the IBD program at Seattle Children's on IBD day. We all placed NG tubes uh, for our EEN. Um, and again, we did this because it's such an important aspect of treatment of care in pediatric IBD. And this is a study, a, a meta-analysis, really just showing you the comparison between EEN and steroids. And although uh, maybe uh, not everybody here has seen meta-analysis, but what this one says is steroids work equally as well as EEN uh, in treating um, pediatric Crohn's disease. But EEN does something different uh, than steroids. And this is why it's such an important aspect uh, of our care and why it's important in terms of the realization that diet has impact. 
So if you look at this, you can see that uh, one of these lines is for EEN, the other for steroids, and this is our clinical indicators. And both EEN uh, and steroids work equally as well in making people feel better, so bringing them into clinical remission. In addition, both EEN and steroids work equally as well in normalizing the inflammatory burden as measured through the blood, so CRP and SED rate. But what EEN does better than uh, steroids is actually bringing uh, the mucosa in the GI tract and healing it uh, completely. And so here you can see in the red steroids, uh, which uh, didn't work as well in terms of healing the bowels, but EEN had a very significant and profound effect on healing the mucosa. Now, I know there's both a pediatric and an adult population here, and many of you may be saying, well, does that work in adults as well? And there's a lot of interesting literature there in adults. Uh, and some would say that maybe it doesn't work as well in adults. But the question is, is it because it doesn't work or is it a question of compliance? Um, and I'll bring up these two studies, oops, two studies, one by uh, Okada and one by o Omorian, um, where they actually required the patient to place a nasogastric tube. So not a question of compliance because when you have an NG tube in, um, you can uh, follow things fairly easily and you actually got equal results as we see in pediatric IBD, uh, which means that EEN most likely works uh, well because uh, it works. And when the studies show it didn't work, probably more likely related to compliance issues. So now you're probably saying, well, EEN, that's not something I'm going to do on a daily basis. Can I bring food in? And does actual food have an impact on our um, IBD? And this is a study looking at something called partial enteral nutrition. So like EEN, but um, you get to eat specific foods as well. And this study uh, looked at partial enteral nutrition in conjunction with something called the Crohn's disease exclusionary diet. And this study, uh, or this diet, uh, is a healthy diet that removes a lot of those uh, processed foods, high sugar foods, etc., cetera, um, on the gut. And they compared two groups. One group was a group that looked at that uh, partial enteral nutrition with the CDED diet. The other group looked at initially EEN, or just the formula for the first six weeks, and then um, uh, formula plus just regular foods or a free diet. And I know this is a little bit of a busy slide, but what it shows is that the formula plus the exclusion diet worked equally as well as the EEN, or just the formula by itself, for that first six weeks. But what was really interesting uh, was that at, for the second uh, six weeks of the study, uh, up to 12 weeks, where the second group got to eat a regular diet, the inflammatory markers went up as compared to the other diet. So telling you that there are foods in our diet that are pro-inflammatory and have an effect on the inflammatory burden within the GI tract. So with all of this information, are there diet or diet therapies in IBD that have an impact on how people feel uh, as well as the inflammatory burden? And there are many, many studies that have been done. Um, most of them are small studies, um, but there are two diets that have been studied uh, very well, one called the specific carbohydrate diet, and we'll go a little bit more into that, and the Mediterranean diet. And uh, 
The SCD, or the Specific Carbohydrate Diet, is a diet that I've been studying uh, over uh, 10 years, and it's kind of similar to a paleo diet, if you've ever heard of that before. It restricts all grains, it restricts uh, sweeteners outside of honey, allows for dairy, but only hard cheeses and a yogurt fermented for 24 hours, and it removes a lot of food additives and therefore it removes a lot of the processed foods. And it focuses on whole foods, fruits and vegetables, and a yogurt fermented for 24 hours. And again, this is one of our, one of our 20 plus studies that we've done uh, looking at uh, SCD. And this is a, a small study, um, but it definitely showed that patients clinically got better and their laboratory studies uh, got better. Um, but what was also interesting from this study is that we looked at the microbiome, we looked at the bacteria within the GI tract to see what was going on there. And before the uh, diet, um, you can see that there was a lot of uh, E. coli and Ruminococcus cannabis. And these are two bacteria that are very pro-inflammatory. And this is in just one patient. But you can see once they went on to the dietary regime that the numbers, the percentage of bacteria that were pro-inflammatory went down fairly significantly. And we looked at the microbiome in a lot of these patients, and what we found is that their microbiome shifted pretty dramatically. Um, now, everybody's microbiome is like a fingerprint, so everybody's is a little bit different. So everybody's microbiome shifted in a little bit of a different way as well. And we recently finished a uh, multi-center uh, prospective study on the SCD and the MSCD. And this study um, looked at um, uh, children with active ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease and uh, looked at them on the SCD as compared to their baseline diet as well as uh, a modified form of the SCD to see if we can liberalize the diet a little bit and get a similar effect. And again, I apologize, a lot of these slides have a lot of information on this, but this is a slide showing the results of the clinical uh, findings. And what this showed were for those individuals who were full completers of the study, that they had a significant benefit in terms of symptoms, uh, meaning that their abdominal pain went down, uh, their diarrhea went down, um, and blood in the stool went down. There, as you can see, also a fair number of individuals who withdrew because dietary intervention can be difficult and it's not necessarily right for everybody. Again, uh, one of the hardest things to change in anybody's life is lifestyle. Um, and so it's not necessarily right for everybody, but we do see uh, an impact in terms of clinical symptoms. What was also really important from the study is that we saw an impact in the fecal calprotectin or the stool inflammatory markers. So the SCD not only, and the MSCD not only made people feel better, but also decrease the infl inflammation for those people who were full completers. And a very similar study was done in adults as well. And this is a study that was done by uh, somebody by the name of James Lewis out at UPenn, um, as well as many other centers, uh, including um, uh, Swedish Medical Center here with uh, Dr. Kiorian. Um, and what they did was they took individuals who had active symptoms and put them either on the specific carbohydrate diet or Mediterranean diet and looked at them for six weeks uh, and then um, gave them food for six weeks. So it, it brought in a, a fair number of patients. Um, and then for the second six weeks, um, the individuals would have to make their own food, but they were uh, continuing on uh, the diet themselves. And what they found was that the Mediterranean diet and the SCD diet seemed to improve individuals clinically uh, very similarly, meaning that um, there was symptomatic remission 
uh, between 43 and 46 uh, percent uh, for both groups, as well as clinical remission uh, between 47 and 48 uh, percent for each group. And we saw a improvement in calprotectin, uh, about 30 percent, uh, but not as much uh, in the CRP. After 12 weeks, uh, that uh, symptomatic improvement uh, continued between 40 and 46 percent, um, and the calprotectin uh, results in CRP were again on the lower side in terms of improvement, uh, 7 versus 26, not statistically different um, for calprotectin, and CRP 7 to 10 percent in terms of uh, seeing change. But I wanted to stop here and just show you the impact that diet has. Um, again, there's still a lot we need to learn in terms of what's going to be the right diet for the right individual. But we do know that diet does have impact. And this is a young man that um, I used to take care of. He's now not a young man anymore. Uh, but when I met him, he was 14 years of age. He had three months history of abdominal pain. Uh, loose stools and weight loss. He was anemic, elevated inflammatory markers, uh, and he underwent endoscopy and colonoscopy. And you can see this. Uh, this is not an unfamiliar picture for many of you. Um, and there is ulceration and irritation. And family wanted to see if they could avoid uh, medication. Uh, and so they went on to the EEN and then to the SCD. And he had been in clinical remission and laboratory remission for over five years. We do always, uh, whether you're on dietary therapy or not, uh, do endoscopy and colonoscopy to assure normalization of the mucosa. And it came back as completely normal after three years with normal histology. And again, this just shows you what the power of diet can be for some individuals. So, what is the dietary advice for you? Um, well, that's probably going to be best a discussion between you, your physician, and uh, a diet, your dietitian. But it's really important to decide how you're going to be using diet, if this is going to be something to just maintain healthy um, uh, lifestyle in conjunction with appropriate medication therapy, and in those scenarios, usually what I recommend uh, is something along the lines of a Mediterranean diet, something that's high in vegetables and fruits, uh, something that uh, decreases the amounts of sugar and processed foods. Um, if somebody is wanting to consider uh, diet as a primary therapy, um, again, uh, it's important to talk with your uh, physician as well as your dietitian but I usually lean towards the SCD or EEN and then the SCD. But the most important thing to remember, no matter how you're going to be using diet, is that diet truly matters. Uh, whether you actually have IBD or not, uh, diet has an impact uh, on all of us. And thank you very much.